already. And turn it off. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it is a pleasure and honor to present our today's speaker, uh, Francoise Forge from the Université Paris Dauphine. Uh, among her other honors, uh, Francoise uh, is the recipient of the 2009 CNRS uh, Silver Medal and an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. She's an expert in information and the use of information in games, uh, all sorts of, of uh, all aspects of information, strategic information transmission, correlation, communication, send the receiver games, uh, name it, and uh, Francoise worked on it and contributed uh, to the literature. And today uh, she's going uh, to tell us about Henry driven dynamics in single peak, single crossing chip talk games. So Francoise, Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Elon. You're really too kind. Um, so uh, this is joint work with Stefan Semira from the University of Grenoble. Um, so uh, the title um, has the word dynamics. Uh, I should say at the outset that there is no learning dynamics. We actually would like to understand better uh, what this, this is really doing from a strategic point of view. Uh, but um, but you, you'll see, I mean, there is an algorithm. So um, you may have heard, uh, not the paper because the paper is not returned, but related uh, presentation of this work uh, under the title Forward Neologism Proof Equilibrium in Chipto Games. That's actually the same project. Uh, but uh, today I would like to insist on the on the construction on the algorithm uh, rather than on the motivation uh, uh, or the literature. Uh, but but you'll see. Uh, so uh, yeah, how do I <coughs> go to the next? Yeah. Uh, so uh, as an introduction, uh, very short reminder on cheap talk. Uh, so uh, I don't think that it's necessary to remind you, uh, I mean, given the audience uh, that I expect today, uh, I don't think it's really uh, necessary to remind you that uh, cheap talk starts with Oman and Mashler uh, 66 or even better, Oman, Mashler and Stearns in 1968. Uh, in fact, they studied infinitely repeated games of inf complete information where information transmission is really important, but they uh, don't have a discount factor. Um, so that means that uh, several stages can just be used to transmit information and actually can be used uh, for cheap talk purposes. Uh, and it turns out that many of their examples can be reinterpreted in a, in a short term, in short term games, so really games with cheap talk. And one paper where you can uh, realize that is the well-known paper by Oman and Art uh, on long cheat tools. So what, what they have is finite <laughs> types, finite many actions, so mixed strategies play a very important role in these papers. Uh, I don't have to tell you about Crawford and Sobel, that's probably the best known paper on uh, cheap talk. They have a continuum of types, uh, revalued decision, well-behaved utility functions, in fact, they an analyze a kind of example or family of examples, um, and they, they get very uh, precise results uh, in that framework. Uh, the literature on cheap talk is just huge. Um, one paper I'd like to mention, a paper by Alexander Frook, published in GEB in 2016. There, there are finitely many ties, but the uh, decisions are revalued and the utility function satisfy the same assumptions as in Crawford and Sobel. Uh, actually, that's the model we're going to consider, but uh, Fruk is not interested in refinements. So uh, refinements have also been studied a lot in uh, send and receiver games, in chip talk games, starting with Farrell. Uh, re standard refinements, uh, standard uh, concept, uh, don't give much, uh, don't have much power in uh, cheap talk games. Some of them do, um, but most of them don't have power. Uh, so uh, Farrell proposed the neologism proof uh, equilibrium, 
the problem of this is that it, it, it doesn't exist in, in general. There are many cases where you don't have a neurosism proof equilibrium. Uh, there are two uh, papers, one by Matthew Zokuno Fujiwara and Postelwiz, and another one by uh, Maylat and the same uh, co-authors, uh, where they, they propose uh, refinements that are uh, appropriate for cheap talk games, and, I, and I'll tell you about them in a, in a minute. Uh, again, there is a huge literature. I'd like to point out that there are two recent papers uh, still dealing with the topic, uh, one by Gordon and co-authors, another one by Daniel Clark, who was a PhD student of Drew Fudenberg. Uh, this is just to show that the, the topic is still very, very active. Uh, so uh, the framework now. Um, the ingredients uh, are a finite set of types for the sender, a prior probability distribution over uh, the set of types, a finite set of messages uh, with at least as many messages as types, a set of decisions. For the moment, I don't make any assumptions on this, but in a second, I'll be very more precise. Utility functions for the sender and the receiver, uh, these are type dependent, uh, defined over decisions, and they don't depend at all on the messages. That's why we talk about cheap talk, because messages don't uh, play a role in the utility functions. So the, the, all results will, will require in assumptions on x, u theta, and v theta, but for the moment, I don't make uh, many, um, I don't make any specific assumption. So the timing, uh, which is very standard for sender receiver game, uh, a type is chosen according to the prior probability distribution. The sender is informed of his type. Of course, the receiver is not. The sender sends a message to the receiver. The receiver chooses an action as a function of the message. And finally, they get payoff, which only depend on the type and the decision. So uh, we are going to focus on pure strategy uh, equilibria. So uh, a pure strategy of the sender uh, induces a partition of the types. Uh, and we will denote as pi of theta the cell that contains theta. So now the, the interpretation is that the receiver infers from the message that uh, the type belongs to cell pi. And in that case, he updates his belief uh, by limiting the possible types to this cell pi. So this is his posterior, p theta over p of pi. Uh, according to the prior, so this is his posterior, and he maximizes his expected utility at his updated belief. And he does that of every cell, uh, which, which is the same as every message that is sent at equilibrium. And to describe a perfect Bayesian equilibrium, the partition should be incentive compatible, which means that given the best response of the uh, receiver, the sender should not profit from lying on his type. So he should be happier with the message that induces the cell it belongs to, happier with that than with any other message, any other cell of the partition. If you like, you can think of this as a canonical representation of pure Bayesian equilibria in this uh, framework. And they can made they can be made perfect vision uh, equilibria by assuming that out of the equilibrium the uh, send the receiver just makes a decision that is uh, taken for one of the uh, messages that is sent at the equilibrium. Uh, so, Francois, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, in this incentive compatible condition, it seems that the receiver observes the partition even after a deviation of the sender? Uh, he keeps that partition. Uh, so uh, 
the, the partition is the same thing as knowing the strategy. I mean, uh, we are taking the on so the uh, receiver best response to the uh, to the strategy of the other, mm -hmm. and this is given, yeah. and that's it. I mean, okay. yeah, if, yeah. If, if he sees anything else, uh, he might as well just because there is no cost uh, in uh, there is no the, the, the there is no cost that is involved, and he the 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 utility. Uh, of the receiver doesn't depend at all on the on the signal, so uh, he he might as well just out of equilibrium he might just take one of the decisions he would have taken at equilibrium. That is a way to make perfect any uh, equilibrium. Yeah. But but the but but the, the, you're right in the sense that he he, he knows the partition uh, in the same way as he would know the strategy of the sender uh, in a, another possible description of the equilibrium. Okay. Thanks. I have um, a question too, if I may. Sorry. I've got a question as well, if I may. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. Just a clarification question. In the model, you mentioned that the number of messages is maybe greater than the number of types. But yes, right. In your case, it would not actually have any meaning, right? To have a, a greater number yes. of messages. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Once you, you go to the to this presentation, it doesn't make uh, you 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 it's not useful. You can have them, but they, they will not play any role in the representation of equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. And then the other question. So uh, I don't really yet understand why there is no option for an off path message. No, they, they are, they, they, this, this, this can be, you have off pass messages and you may have several uh, decisions uh, that are uh, taken on these. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that you can make any partitional equilibrium a perfect Bayesian one by assuming that out of equilibrium, you just take a decision that was already taken at equilibrium. So what I'm saying is that any Nash equilibrium here can be made perfect Bayesian by, so if you take the partition, mm -hmm. not only induces a Nash equilibrium, but it induces a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. That's what I'm saying. Can you please repeat then why? So if you have a Nash equilibrium- because, because out of equilibrium, you may always assume that out of equilibrium, it is it, it, you. You 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 have a, a belief. You can have a, any kind of belief. You mm -hmm. you believe that it's a type that is in one element. Uh, that is, if you get message M, uh, uh, message M that was not an equilibrium, you have the belief that you make the belief that corresponds to some message M prime that was sent at equilibrium, and you make the decision you were taking on that message, and it makes the, the equilibrium perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the reason why. That's the reason why in cheap talk games, uh, you you can make any equilibrium perfect Bayesian, because mm -hmm. you may always assume. I mean, that there is no cost for anybody. Uh, the the so the, the the receiver may as well believe um, that that the, uh, an out of pass message uh, has the same meaning. You, you can do exactly on the on an off-pass message what you would have done on non-on-pass message. Okay. Okay. No, that, that, that's that's a simple point, but uh, we should be sure we we agree on this because uh, afterwards I will just compare equilibria between each other, and I will just consider these partitions, um, and. Uh, so the here I, I I will not use a logic of out of equilibrium messages, but really the selection of equilibria will be made by comparing equilibria with each other. Mm -hmm. But let, let's go on, and if, if, if okay. some further clarification is needed on this, of course I'd be happy to to, to yeah to give further explanation. Sure. So, um, so we have that representations in terms of uh, partitions. Uh, and if you look uh, carefully at some refinements that were proposed in this uh, context, 
uh, they are easily reformulated uh, in, in, in as a partitional equilibria. So our, our formulation is, is formally uh, different, but really it's, it's just one way of writing what was proposed before. So uh, there, are, um, there is a very uh, popular refinement uh, that was proposed by Farrell uh, in 1993. In fact, much earlier, but there were several versions of the paper and so on. Uh, actually, um, he did not have uh, many results, but he had this idea that there could be a ne uh, neologism. So um, a neologism will be sent by a subset of types, T, uh, and it will be signaling, it will be a neologism relative to some equilibrium. So a given equilibrium is a partition pi with the understanding that on every cell, the receiver best response. So that, that's a, an equilibrium partition. And a set of types is uh, signaling if uh, all uh, types in that set are happier with what they would get if the sender understands and optimizes relatively to, uh, to T. So why T is the optimal uh, action of the receiver having updated this belief to T and knowing that the types are in T, uh, they are happier. So the, they get a higher payoff with at least one strict inequality. So this is the minimal requirement. So Farrell thinks of that as something that is uh, somehow that can be proved uh, by the uh, deviating types. So there is a set of types, they, 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 they can convince the sender that they are in T. But of course, this is not enough because uh, the way in which the sender uh, anticipates the receiver's action out of equilibrium, out of T, or out of this, for those who are not sending the neologism uh, matters. So what Farad assumes is that out of these sig signaling types, uh, you just stick to the original decisions. So that means that uh, to be self-signaling, uh, you require that the types that are not in the neologism, the types that are not in the signaling set, get a lower payoff, but assuming that they would get what they originally got at equilibrium. And the neologism proof uh, equilibrium is one for which there is no self-signaling set. Uh, we see an example in a, in a second, uh, but um, of course you can make other assumptions uh, on what happens out of T. And Maylat uh, and his co-authors, and to some extent Matthews and his co author also, uh, they assume that the receiver makes inferences from T. So he, he starts thinking, and if sometimes go to T, um, it's not that you should stick to the decision you made out of T, but uh, you think that the deviation should occur within an equilibrium. So it should be incentive compatible for the types in T to signal that they are in T. So uh, they say that an incentive compatible partition, an equilibrium is defeated if there is a set of types that is signaling. So all types in T are better off if they get the optimal decision knowing that they are in T. But you ask that this is part of some incentive compatible partition pi prime. So in other words, you compare an equilibrium pi prime and the given equilibrium P, and you say that pi prime defeats P if there is a cell of pi prime incentive compatible partition such that all types in this cell prefer the new equilibrium. And of course, what you are looking for is undefeated partitions. So this is a way to compare equilibria with one another 
and you select an equilibrium that is not defeated by any other equilibrium. So that's the that's the concept uh, of uh, Meilat and his co-author and the intention, let's say, of Matthews and his co-authors, but I don't have the time to give details. Uh, so let, let's show an example. Um, and after that, maybe you, you'll have uh, further questions. So here you have two types. Uh, it's not written on the slide, but they are equally likely. Type one and type two have both probability one half. And there are three decisions for the sender, left, center, and right. And here are the payoff. The first payoff is for the sender. The second payoff is for the receiver. So let us look at the receiver first. Um, he has three, two, zero, zero, two, three. That means that at the prior one half, uh, being completely uncertain, he would choose decision C. Uh, because uh, his expected payoff is higher uh, with C than with L or R. So as is always the case in cheap talk games, you have a non-revealing equilibrium with um, the partition then is a single cell because the decision is the same, whatever the type. And so if these two types send the same message, the uh, best response of the receiver is to make decision C. And obviously, if he doesn't listen and just makes decision C, there is no point in sending the information and you always get such a non-revealing equilibrium. And NR will always denote the non-revealing partition, the one with a single cell. Now, consider uh, here you can check also that there is no completely revealing equilibrium. Completely revealing equilibrium would mean that you have two cells, one and two. Now, if the receiver believes that he faces type, type one, he chooses left. If he believes he faces type two, he chooses right. But then this is not incentive compatible because type two would rather have the left decision, which gives him a higher payoff. And that means he would pretend to be type one. So CR, this partition is not incentive compatible and it's not an equilibrium. Now let's look at Farrell's concept and consider the neologism one. This is self-signaling. Why? Because type one is happier with Self-signaling for the non-revealing equilibrium, I mean. It's because type one is happier with the left decision than with the central decision. And type two, assuming, comparing with the non-revealing equilibrium, he would not like. He prefers the initial decision where he gets three to what he would get by pretending type one, because this gives him two. So it's self, it is self-signaling in the sense of Farrell. But because there is a single equilibrium, it cannot be defeated by any other, and it is undefeated. So this shows you the difference. And the, the idea is that if type one sends a message to identify itself, and if, this uh, message is sent by type one, then the inference that is made by the receiver is that the non-revealing, if, if Taiwan is able to use that neologism and to convince his type one, then that means that when you get no message, when you get the non-revealing one, it should come from type two. So if there is some inference that is made starting from the deviation, you should, you end up comparing incentive compatible equilibrium, incentive compatible partitions between uh, uh, each other. And uh, here, because there is no other um, incentive compatible partition, uh, you just cannot get one as part of an incentive compatible partition. So it's as simple as that. And in that case, you have 
only the non-revealing one, it's undefeated, and uh, it's not neurorism proof. Uh, and neurorism proof is, uh, is uh, as true, I believe it has to, to draw back, it has that rigidity that that is uh, that out of equilibrium you just out of the neologism you just stick to the old equilibrium, uh, and the consequence is that usually uh, it doesn't exist. I mean, the, the, there is no general existence result for the um, neologism proof equilibrium. Uh, with more than two types there may also be no undefeated partition. You can have cycles and in general, the concept doesn't behave so well. So um, what, what happens is that we are going to make um, further assumptions. Actually, we're going to make the same assumptions as in Crawford and Sobel, except that we will keep finitely many types. And we are going to show that in that case, uh, there is uh, there is a, a non defeated partition. So uh, unless there are questions at this point, uh, let me uh, tell you the assumptions. So that that, that looks uh, a bit frightening, but these are assumptions you are very familiar with. They are very simple and very uh, standard. So um, first of all, we assume that the types are ordered. So uh, theta one is strictly smaller than theta two and so on. And the decisions are real valued. Uh, and the utility functions are well behaved in the sense that they are strictly concave. Uh, they are single peak. So there is a unique maximal element um, for the sender as well as for the receiver. Uh, the receiver has an upward bias, which means that the optimal decision for the sender is always higher than the optimal decision for the receiver. You have single crossing, which means that um, it's the usual, but it means that you have increasing differences. Uh, in practice, I mean, the, the easier uh, consequence of this is that the uh, optimal decisions are increasing with the type. So an example where all these assumptions are satisfied is the um, quadratic case, where the, uh, the optimal decision of the receiver is just, uh, the, he tries to match the state as, as close as possible. And there is a little bias uh, for the uh, sender. So um, in, under these assumptions, um, you can still have that the non-revealing partition is the uh, only incentive compatible one, and that it's, it's not neurorism proof. And in that case, it would be undefeated. So the situation of the, the example can still arise in the, under these assumptions. Uh, but on the other hand, if the completely revealing partition is incentive compatible, then it is really the best one you can hope for. It defeats every incentive compatible co partition. It is itself undefeated. So this is not true in general, but it will be true here, that there is a kind of uh, positive value for uh, information in that sense. Uh, it can nevertheless happen that you have two undefeated partition, typically the non-revealing one and a partially revealing one. So uh, the main result uh, is that uh, we have existence of a non-defeated partition. So, um, if there is any question, I'm, I'm of course uh, happy to answer. Uh, okay, so um, the way in which we, we proceed is to uh, construct explicitly the undefeated partition uh, by means of an algorithm. Um, when I say algorithm, you see it's rather a family of algorithms. Uh, we, we don't have, uh, there are several uh, ways of running uh, the algorithm. 
But still what is uh, quite uh, surprising is that any way in it is uh, performed um, leads to the same partition. So I'm going to show that in, in, a, in a second. Um, so um, under the assumptions, um, the optimal decision of the receiver on a server partition is unique and well-defined. So now the decision is uh, given a cell of a partition, given a set of types, the optimal decision is just unique because we have these uh, single peaked um, utility functions. Uh, another property is that any incentive compatible partition is connected. That means that it is made of intervals of type, so consecutive types. So uh, yeah, that, that's uh, as simple as that. So you, you have one decision that is made on, uh, on the first type and then on the second uh, group of types and so on. And if you have a partition, so pi one is a set of types and then pi two, the next ones and so on, then you get the that the, the decisions are increasing uh, and that the, 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 the decision that is made on some cell is always between the decision that would made on the uh, smaller element and the, the one that would be made on the uh, higher element. So everything is well ordered. So uh, for the sequel, uh, I, I'm going to give you an idea of the of the proof of the of the result. Some uh, I'm going to define the algorithm very precisely through some concepts that are uh, NV, left incentive compatibility, and white word partitioning. Then I shall show you the convergence of the algorithm and any variant of the algorithm to a unique incentive compatible partition. This will be the first proposition. And then I will show that the limit partition we obtain is undefeated. So, um, So uh, here is the description of the uh, algorithm. So if, if I have a partition pi, which is not necessarily incentive compatible, and two cells of the partition, I say that type theta in cell pi and the envies, uh, type pi prime, if he gets a higher utility, in cell pi prime than in cell pi. So the decision associated with cell pi prime is better for type theta. So that means he envies. And of course, incentive compatible means you don't have any envy. But we will start with a weaker concept of incentive compatibility and say that pi is left incentive compatible if no type envies a cell on its left. So let us start the algorithm with any partition that is left incentive compatible. It turns out that there is such a partition and it will be very important, uh, which is the completely revealing partition. If every type is alone in itself, if you have a partition of single tons, it will be left incentive compatible. We shouldn't worry so much about that for the moment. Let's start with a partition that is um, connected and left incentive compatible. So, so that no type envies a cell on the left. Well, intuitively, you know, uh, you to be a higher type he, here means something. And so somehow the higher types are better treated and in principle, um, you, you wouldn't envy low types and you rather envy high ones. It's, it may happen that this property is not satisfied, but it's a natural property. 
Um, so no, if it's if if it's less incentive compatible but not incentive compatible, that means that there is some type that envies a cell on its right. So there is some cell that is on the right, so with k prime higher than k, and type theta envies this cell. But it might not be the next cell. And theta might be any type in the middle of a cell. That may happen. But what you can show, and this is crucial, and this is what the assumptions give you, is that if there is some theta envying a cell on the right, there is a theta that is maximal in its cell that envies the next one. And this one, because it is the, the largest type in the cell, you can just move it to the next cell because it, it envies the next one. So in that case, you just shift uh, one, uh, one type to the next cell. You can recompute the optimal responses. What can happen is that the cell where this type was is becomes empty because it was the only one. So it goes to the next cell and that means uh, the cell is empty or it has one element less. And the one that was next on the right will have one more element. You recompute the optimal response of the receiver on these two cells that are affected, one possible, one of them possibly empty, and you define a new partition. That's the algorithm. Now, you see, the principle is always the same, but you have some flexibility in the choice of, I mean, possibly some flexibility in the choice of the, the envying type and the, 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 the cell you, you move it. Because of course, once you have identified one that you, you move to the next cell, that then it becomes perfectly perfectly well defined. But there are several ways to run this, possibly several ways. So n by r is a set of envy driven partitions. So the ones you can construct by this uh, procedure. So now let us let me show the, the convergence. Uh, if at every stage pi r is left incentive compatible, then pi r plus one constructed in the way I just described is also left incentive compatible. So left incentive compatibility will be preserved at every step of the algorithm. And be, because you, you shift everything to the, to the right, possibly emptying some cells, you can show that if you start at any left incentive compatible partition, you reach in finitely many steps an incentive compatible partition. So now you can divide end upper bar by zero as the set of incentive partitions that you reach by such sequences. So the only thing we have at this point is that we start with an initial partition that is left incentive compatible and the algorithm any variant of the algorithm will lead you to incentive compatible partitions. At this point, there might be several of them and you have a full set of them, but they're incentive compatible. Okay, so that's one, one, one thing. Now we introduce a dominance relation between partitions. So um, we say that pi two, dominates by one if pi two is more to the right. So it pi two will have more elements and how his here's how we compare the two partitions. So let's pi one, this is represented here. Take any cell of pi one and consider the highest element in pi one. This is max pi one. This is somewhere in pi two. Maybe in pi two it's not the highest element. But now consider the minimum of the cell pi one. It must be the case that the minimum of the cell containing this in pi two is higher. So it's more to the right. So you, you have this shift that uh, 
in pi 2. In that case, we say that pi 2 dominates uh, pi 1. So uh, you can show that the non-revealing partition is minimal. Every partition is larger, I mean, dominates the non-revealing one. And the completely revealing partition dominates all partitions. So uh, the completely revealing partition, uh, of course, it's not necessarily incentive compatible. Usually it will not be incentive compatible, but it is maximal. And this relation is, of course, anti-symmetric. So let's go back to uh, the algorithm. Uh, and now, uh, if pi r dominates an incentive compatible partition, you can show that the same happens for pi r plus one. So domination is maintained all along the algorithm. Now take a limit partition, a one that is obtained as a limit from pi zero, starting from pi zero. At this point, we, we know these are well-defined, but there might be several partitions there. The partition we reach is incentive compatible. Now you can show that if pi zero dominates pi, then the same happens for every partition that is reached as the limit of the algorithm. So by the same token, if pi zero dominates every incentive compatible partition, then the same happens with every partition that is in the limit. But now, because we have an anti-symmetric relation, the set of incentive compatible partitions dominating every incentive compatible partition can have at most one element. But we have partitions like in corollary, this corollary because the completely revealing partition dominates every partition. So what do we get out of this exercise is that, that we get a unique incentive compatible partitions that dominates all partitions that are uh, incentive compatible. Hmm? So um, how do we do? Uh, we know that if we start with pi zero completely revealing, this uh, will be a, a single ton because at the limit, we will dominate all incentive compatible partitions. So uh, we get a single ton. And uh, we have, in addition, that it uh, dominates any uh, partition. So that's what the algorithm does. Uh, it's a bit mechanical, uh, but it, it gives uh, an incentive compatible partition that dominates in the sense of all dominance relation every uh, incentive compatible uh, partition. So uh, at this point, this doesn't seem to have so much relationship with the um, the uh, refinement we, we had in mind. So uh, now we have to show that the uh, the partition is undefeated. Before that, let me uh, illustrate how it works in a little example. Uh, so let's take the uniform quadratic case. So we have 11 types in theta. Every type has the same probability. And let's consider quadratic utility uh, functions. So um, with the bias of two for the sender. So you start with the completely revealing partition. So every type is a single ton. Uh, you can check that every type, so the, the, the ideal point is uh, theta plus two. So um, the ideal uh, of 10 uh, is 12. So he would rather uh, shift. So he type 10, and this type 11. But in the same way, type one and this type two, I mean, they all envy the next one. Um, but let's do the algorithm by 
merging, moving type 10 to the cell it envies. So we merge 10 with 11. Then you have still many envies, but let's say we check what happens with type 9. And you can check that type 9 envies 10 and 11. So we, we all have him joining the next one, and we can do so until 5 to 11 are together. Now, 4 is indifferent, so we don't move it. But 3 still envies 4, so we put 4 and 3 together. This lowers what uh, 4 gets, because the optimal decision is the average. So now um, uh, 4 is not happy anymore, and 4 can join the next one. So you see how it works. And you end up with this partition, one, two together, and all the other ones together. If we have done this differently by merging cells by the same procedure, but in a different order, you can prove that you end up with the same. So this is really uniquely defined. Um, if you start with the left incentive compatible partition and just use the NV relation as we described it. So this is the partition we reach. So as I said, now the point is to show that it is undefeated and I just have the time to do so. Um, so now let's, we, we will compare, the intention is to compare all partition pi star, the one we have constructed by the algorithm with any other incentive compatible partition. So consider the highest type um, in every cell pi. So for the moment, let's take a cell pi of the partition and let theta be the maximal element of some cell. Now take another partition that dominates this partition pi and in which pi is also maximal in this cell. That looks like a strong assumption, but this is easily fulfilled by just taking pi zero as the completely revealing partition and it, any theta. Because if it's a single ton, it's obviously maximal. And pi zero dominates any partition. So you have that. So just think of the completely revealing partition and any type. Now assume that the type is maximal in some cell. Then you can show that, I mean, that's pretty obvious. He would rather, this type is prefers pi zero. He gets a higher utility in pi zero than in pi. Um, because he's the highest in his cell, so he would rather be isolated. Now you can show that if it's the case, at every step of the algorithm, whatever ways it is run, uh, if you start the algorithm at pi zero, Theta also prefers pi r to pi, z, to, to pi. Pi zero is not incentive compatible. Along the algorithm, you gain in incentive compatibility, but pi r is not necessarily incentive compatible. But no, this goes to the limit. So theta also prefers uh, any pi r bar uh, that is the limit to pi. But when we consider as a starting partition, the completely revealing, we have a single partition, which is the pi star uh, I described before. And now what happens is that if we take any incentive compatible partition, every type that is maximal in each cell prefers pi star, the limit partition we have constructed to pi. And that's, that shows that it's undefeated because in every cell of the partition, there is a type that is happier in this pi star. What happens is that all the types that are maximal, that are the maximal element of a cell, prefer this partition we have constructed to any other uh, incentive compatible partition. And as a direct consequence, the partition is undefeated. 
Uh, so let me uh, uh, give, say you a little more on the uh, properties of the, uh, this partition we have constructed. Uh, it is undefeated. Uh, it's not the only one. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if you uh, con we we have an example with uh, quadratic utility functions and uh, uh, some uh, prior uh, in which the algorithm will reach the partition theta one theta two. Uh, this is one cell, and the other cell is theta three theta four. So, a consequence of uh, the construction is that the pi star. Um, as uh, is the finest possible, in, but, but not strictly, uh, in the sense that any uh, final partition with strictly less cells, for instance, uh, or strictly finer, uh, cannot be incentive compatible. But you can have uh, a cell like this, and that's what's happening in this example. Uh, you have theta one, theta two, theta three, theta four, so two cells as well, but this, this partition is also undefeated. And so what happens here is that um, if you take another partition like this one, and you consider the types that are maximal in their partition uh, in their cell, so theta one and theta four, they prefer the partition that is reached by the algorithm. That, that's the property that we have, uh, that every type that is maximal in its cell would prefer the partition that is constructed through the algorithm. Uh, so um, we have uh, other uh, properties. Uh, so pi star is not necessarily neologism proof, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, but uh, this is true of uh, other partitions. Uh, as I said before, uh, pi star is a maximal number of cells among uh, incentive compatible partitions. Um, uh, in some cases, for instance, in the uniform quadratic setting, uh, it is Pareto optimal. So that, that is a property that this has nothing to do with the refinement, but still, I mean, uh, you might, uh, be interested, but uh, it's not, um, th there is nothing uh, of the kind that is guaranteed. But for instance, in uh, Fuchs' paper, he was looking for Pareto optimal partitions and we would uh, reach them, uh, we would reach such a partition uh, by the uh, algorithm. Um, it also, um, it also satisfies a number of other uh, refinement uh, criteria that have been uh, proposed. Uh, so let me let me conclude. Uh, so the undefeated uh, perfect Bayesian equilibrium uh, has been proposed uh, in the literature as a variant of neologism proof uh, uh, perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Um, it has been defended. Uh, by uh, Maylat and uh, others that have proposed this undefeated criterion uh, by kind of forward reasoning from the receiver in the sense that he makes inferences from the message uh, he gets. Um, and the refinement does not select a unique partition, not only does not exist in general, uh, we, we have existence, uh, which is, uh, I think, nice, uh, but uh, we also have uniqueness. Um, so uh, what, what, what would be uh, interesting is to have an intuitive or well-founded uh, justification uh, to defend this partition that is uniquely reached by the algorithm, uh, to defend it by some criterion uh, other than undefeated, since uh, there may be other uh, undefeated uh, partitions. Uh, yeah, I think I can uh, I can stop here, and I would be very happy to answer questions uh, if there are uh, there are any. 
Okay, so uh, are there any questions? Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Francoise. And I turn off the recording and now